نحمده و نسلی علی رسول نبی الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم الدین ایاک نعبد و ایاک نستعین احدن السراط المستقیم سراط الذین انعمت علیهم غیر المغضوب علیهم ولدعوانین آمین قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما فلما سلوا وسلوا على سيدنا ولان محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافرة الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسحبه دائما أبدا سلام و سلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم last uh, couple of weeks we've been talking about Bibi Fatima سلام الله عليها and her perfection and as I mentioned you know she is perfect in her modesty. And we talked a little bit about this again in or after Juma last week. Uh, and I'm going to reiterate that point is that, you know, again, most of us men, when we hear about modesty, we only think about the women. You know, that the women are supposed to be modest. And we forget about the men. Modesty is for both men and women. You know, and so even like with men, the aura, or the private part, is considered between the navel and the knee, uh, which should not show at any time, uh, you know, in front of anybody, that's, that's the bayar mahram. But especially in salat, you know, and unfortunately, you know, there's this trend that's been ongoing for, for a few decades, you know, for the men to wear, wear you know, tight pants, uh, short shirt, and you go into ruku or sajda and everything just opens up. And, and you, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a, a free for all show. Yeah. So, and we need to be aware of this. And, and, and because if, you know, if I go into ruku and everything is hanging out, you know, salat is not valid anymore. And then, you know, what happens with most folks is, yeah, they go into ruku and everything's hanging and then they stand up and then they straighten out, you know, again, you know, and then they go in the sajda and the same thing happens and then, you know, it's just back and forth. Uh, you know, basically invalidating the salat. So, you know, again, just reiterating that point, we need to be careful. Uh, modesty is for both men and women in Islam. Uh, you know, the regulations are different, but, you know, no one is exempt from this. Uh, Rasulullah so emphasized, you know, that in the one who has no modesty, you know, he has no iman. So, I mentioned a couple of things last week, uh, which we're going, I'm going to kind of uh, go into the background of some of them. One, one thing uh, which we'll talk about later was I mentioned when Samri, you know, made the golden calf and he put the dust uh, or the sand from underneath the hoof uh, of, Jibri, of, of the horse of Jibreel al Islam into it and it started making a noise. So that's the point that I'm going to talk about later, inshallah. Uh, we might start on that today, or if not, then next week, inshallah. But the other point that we talked about was the miracle of Rasulullah of, uh, of splitting the moon. We're being attacked from every angle, you know, and, but this isn't new. The attacks aren't new. Our response is what's new. Uh, the attacks have been there forever. And if you look at all of these attacks, the basis of all of the attacks is ego. And so they attack the miracles of the prophets and if they can't attack the miracles directly then they attack the miracles of those who follow the prophets but this is to separate us from those that Allah loves I mean, the whole purpose behind that the reality is not to show some type of fact or to prove some type of point other than to separate us 
from the lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent every prophet with miracles. And he refers to them in the Quran as signs, his signs. You know, he says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا You know, and we sent our, our messenger Musa al Islam with signs. What are the signs? And he talks about the signs. What were the signs? You know, that he would throw his staff and it would become a serpent. He pulled out his arm and it would be a light. Or his hand would be a light. You know, the punishments that came on the people of Fir'aun. Again, these are all signs. These are miracles. You know, this parting of the sea. Again, this is a miracle of Musa alayhi salam. You know, the water coming from the stone. You know, the 12 uh, springs that, that sprung from the stone after he hit it with his staff. Again, these are miracles of Musa alayhi salam. And I guess before we get into what, you know, miracles themselves, you know, we have to have an understanding of what, what miracles are or what's the definition of a miracle. You know, a miracle is something that happens that should not happen. That should be impossible to happen. You know, it's the realization of an impossibility. When a prophet does it, it is called a mojza. When the followers of a prophet do it, it is called kiramat. And there is a distinction here and we'll get into that inshallah as well. But these are proofs of the Prophet's prophethood. You know, when a Prophet does it, this is a proof of his prophethood. Because this is a challenge to society, that if you're challenging what I'm saying, then do something like this. And the Prophet never says that he's doing this on his own. He always says that he is doing this with the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there are some other things that people do that they do without the or, or do uh, uh, without acknowledging the authority of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and those are other things which I'm not going to get into right now, inshallah. So all of the prophets were sent with miracles, and if you look at the miracles of every prophet, they were in line with whatever was going on, big going on in society at that time, and they challenged. You know, the arrogance of society itself. You know, if we look at the miracles of Musa alayhi salam. You know, at, his, at the time of Musa alayhi salam, what, what was big in, in Egypt? All of these magicians. Doing all of these things that, you know, baffled the mind. And they did all of these things, and, and Fir'aun would have them do these things to show his own authority. Oh, see? And they're doing this because of me. To, to raise up his claim of being God. So Musa al-Islam is sent with miracles that expose their magic. Destroys their magic. And they have no response to what he does. Isa alayhi salam comes, you know, and in his time medical knowledge was supposed to be at a, at a peak. And you had all of these healers everywhere healing people from all of these sicknesses. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Isa alayhi salam with miracles that they have no response to. You know, yeah, they're curing somebody with pneumonia, but raise the dead. Cure the leper. And one of the other, and all of the all of the prophets were sent with the miracle of knowledge. You know, knowledge that no one could challenge. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala mentions this specifically as far as Isa al Islam is concerned, where he says that one of his miracles was what, that he would tell you what you ate, and what you left in your house. It didn't matter where you came from, if you came from next door a hundred miles away, a thousand miles away, on the other side of the globe, if you came to him, he could tell you what you ate and what you left in your house. Which is knowledge of what? The unseen. When Rasulullah's time, times, when his time comes, you have in Arabian society, you know, this arrogance of language. 
because their language was so superior to everybody else's. In reality, it was superior, and it is superior. You know? And their ability to manipulate the language you know, exceeded what anybody else could do. You know, they could do poetry for days on end without repeating a, uh, you know, a poem. You know, and making everything exactly in its place. The other thing that was going on at his time was in every corner you had a kahin, a soothsayer, you know, someone who could tell you your future, tell you what you need, what you wanted to know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa with the miracle, with many miracles, but two of the most well known of his miracles, the Quran, you know, with a language that they had no answer for. To the extent that when the leaders of, of Quraysh, such as Walid bin Mughayra, he hears, you know, even short verses or Surah Inna Ataina, what does he say? He says that this cannot be the word, the words of a human. This is something else. He himself, you know, he's a, he's a master of their language. You know, yet he himself has to acknowledge this. He refuses to acknowledge the prophethood of Rasulullah but he has to acknowledge that these are not the words of a human. And he sent with the knowledge that they have no response to either. You know, when Abu Jahl comes and he says, what is in, if you are a prophet, tell me what is in my hand. Not only does he come with the knowledge, but he comes with the, with the authority to transfer that knowledge. And not only transfer it to animate things, to living things, but to inanimate objects, stones and trees and everything else. So when Abu Jahl comes and he says, what is in my hand? Rasulullah says that if what is in your hand tells you who I am, then what? And he looks, at the, he looks toward the hand. In reality, he's looking toward what is in the hand. And the stone starts saying what? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu annaka Rasulullah. Ashhadu innaka Rasulullah. Rasulullah And I bear witness that there's no one worthy of worship but Allah and I bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. Not only did he transfer the knowledge, but he also transferred the ability to speak that knowledge. I've never heard a stone speak. And yet, here the stones are speaking. And what does Abu Jahl do? He throws them. He says, ah, this is magic. Because whenever the prophets came with miracles, those who believed in them said, yes, this is a miracle that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this prophet the authority to do. But those who opposed them said what? You know, whether it's Musa al-Islam or Isa al-Islam and now Rasulullah so some of they say, oh, this is magic. They didn't deny that the Prophet did it. They acknowledged that the Prophet is the one who's doing it. But what they said was, oh, this isn't a miracle, this is magic. So even the disbelievers had to acknowledge that this is the doing of the Prophet. Even though they denied his prophethood. And they said, oh, this is magic. Now, when we look at miracles, you know, you have certain miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows certain things to happen for someone. And that someone doesn't even realize that it's really, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing it for them. And this is kind of a, you know, he's done it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done it for somebody, but he does, that person doesn't realize that it's for them. Then you have other miracles where Allah subhanahu wa does something for somebody hmm, or allows something to happen. Because again, everything is from Allah. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Yeah. There's no power or authority except Allah. But when He gives this as a gift to somebody, then to deny it is also disbelief. But they are, so there are miracles where it happens for somebody, but that someone doesn't have any authority over it. An example of this is Bibi Maryam. Salam Allah You know, when she's locked in the room, 
You know, Allah SWT sends the food. He sends it for her, because of her. And the food is what, what is out of season. But she had no say so in what she received. Allah sent it for her. Bas. Now that was it. But then you have miracles where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the authority to the one, to that person, that you do this when you want to do this. And again, we can look at the example of Bibi Maryam, salamullah alayha. You know, when Isa al-Islam is being born, the food didn't come automatically. The water didn't come automatically. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told her, when you want the water, hit the ground. The water came up. When you want the fruit, shake the tree. The fruits fell. Even though the fruit, the tree was dead. They said, shake the tree and the, tr and the fruits fell. So now when you want it, I give you the authority. If you look at the miracles of Rasulullah sallallahu the vast majority of his miracles fall under this category. When he wanted it, Allah SWT had given him the authority and he did it. Period. When he wanted the son to return for Ali, he, took, he commanded it to return and it returned. When he wanted the stones in the hand of Abu Jahl to speak, they spoke. When he wanted all of these things, he simply gave it uh, uh, an ishara, a, a, a gesture or a hint to it to do this, and it happened. You know, this is the authority Allah SWT sent Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with. When we look at the miracle of returning of, or, or the breaking of the moon, the splitting of the moon, And the reason I come back to this, and I mentioned this last week, is because there is a person who's supposed to be a scholar who acknowledges that the moon split. I mean, this is something that even Chakarwali, who was a king in southern India, documented. And that documentation was found in British libraries because when the British went in, you know, they would take everything. They would take it back to, to Britain and then they would sort through it. So they would take all of the libraries back to Britain. You know, there's actually there are certain Quran that are in Oxford University Library that they carbon dated recently. Writings, Surah Taha, uh, the beginning of Surah Taha, and on that, that uh, skin that it's written on, when they carbon dated it, it dated back to 600 or so. So which is when the verses were revealed. So in their library, you know, there is mention, you know, where this king mentions where he saw the splitting of the moon. So you can't say that, oh, this is something that the Muslims made up. So this scholar, he acknowledges, yes, th this happened, but he says, what does he say? Or the so-called scholar, he says, you know, if you look at the verses, and Surah Qamar, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Iqtarabit Sa'atu, Wan Shakkal Qamar. You know, the hour has come and the moon has split asunder. So he takes this verse and he recites it and he says, See, this is simply a sign of the hour. This is something that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala sent as the sign of the hour. You know, Rasulullah Sussum had nothing to do with this. The thing is, you know, if you see a natural occurrence or a natural phenomenon, whether it's an earthquake, uh, you know, a tsunami or anything else, or an asteroid falling, no one says that, oh, this is magic. And no one says that, oh, this is a miracle that somebody else, you don't attribute it to some human. When an earthquake happens, you say what? Oh, this is the, uh, this is the authority and the power of Allah. Unless somebody comes and says, oh, this happened because of me. Then you can say, okay, well, maybe it's a miracle. Like the Shh. 
then you can say that maybe this is a miracle, like the miracle when Mahdi al-Islam will, will, will come and the army that will fight against him will be swallowed by the earth. Hmm? Or you could, or if you say that this is someone indecent person, you say, oh, this is, if you attribute it to him, you say, oh, this is magic. Hmm? When the moon was split, what did the Quraysh say? You know, and al Spatal mentions that in the next verse. You know, after he says that اِقْتَرَبَتِ السَّعَةُ وَنْشَقَ الْقَمَرِ That the hour has come and the moon is split asunder. What does he say? When you row, ayatin yu'ridu wa yaqulu sihrum mustamir. And when they see a sign of Allah, they turn away and they say, oh, this is evident magic. Which is interesting because now this proves that even Quraysh acknowledged that Rasulullah Sussam did this. <coughs> so even the kuffar of Quraysh acknowledged that this was the doing of Rasulullah Sussam. The Muslims acknowledge that this is the doing of Rasulullah Sussam under the authority of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So this person who says, oh no, this had nothing to do with Rasulullah He is worse than even the kuffar of Quraysh. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, he's worse than them. That's right. You know? His name is Javed Ghamdi. But this is his claim. And he has other claims that support the Qadiani. You know, these are people that are propped up as scholars in the Muslim world. When we look at miracles, you know, again, these, these are also an inheritance of prophethood. So as I said, mojza are the miracles that are done by the prophets. But then you have kirana, which are done by those who are under the prophet, the lovers of that prophet and these are also proven in the Quran in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Naml uh, which is Surah number 27 if you start from verse number 38 uh, after Sulaiman al-Islam he sends an invitation to Bilqis the Queen of Sheba to come and meet him and she accepts the invitation and she leaves her homeland and after she leaves Sulaiman al-Islam is having a court you know holding court and in verse number 38, he asked the nobles among his court. You know, and remember, his court is not only men, but also jinn, and also animals. So he asked them, he says, who will bring her court, or who will bring her throne, because her throne was famous, a massive throne. He says, who will bring her throne to me before she arrives? And so, one of the ifrit, uh, ifrit min al jinn. One of the ifrit among the jinn. You know, ifrit are a type of jinn. You know, a lot of us when we think of jinn, we think of just one thing. You know, but jinn also have races among them, just like humans have races, of, uh, just like we have races among ourselves. Hmm? So one of them says that I will bring it to you before you disperse your court, before you get up and leave. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, and he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this person, that this is one of those to whom the knowledge, ilmul minal kitab, you know, the knowledge of the book, one of those who had the knowledge from the book. He says that I will bring it, and he is, he's not jinn, he is human. And his name is Asif bin Barkhiyah, radiallahu anhu. He's one of the companions of Sulaiman al-Islam, one of the human companions of Sulaiman al-Islam. He says, I will bring it to you before your, before your sight leaves, even before you glance. And when Sulaiman al-Islam glances over there, the throne is already there. So to deny the miracles of the followers of a prophet is to deny the Quran. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this specifically in the Quran. Again, Surah Namr, Namr, Surah number 27. 
Now, the interesting thing, though, is that if you look at the miracles of the followers of a prophet, they are in line with the miracles of that prophet. You know, if you look at the miracles of Suleiman al Islam, what were his miracles? Transportation, teleportation. You know, he would ride on this flying carpet. Somebody says, oh, you know, I'm afraid that Israel al Islam is coming for me, so he send me someplace else. So he sends them to China. He does this, he does that. So the follow, his followers, the, the miracle of Asif bin Barkhiyah is in line with the miracles of Sulaiman al -Salam. The miracles of the followers of Musa al -Salam would be in line with his miracles. The miracles of the followers of Isa al -Salam are in line with his miracles. The miracles of the lovers of Rasulullah are in line with the miracles of Rasulullah And the miracles of Rasulullah have no limits. You know, if you look at the miracles of previous prophets, they were all confined to this earth. Yet the miracles of Rasulullah were not confined to this earth, but in the heavens and they transcend in time and, and space. You know, if you look at the miracle of, of Miraj, of the ascension itself, you know, time and space are left behind. And so when we look at the miracles of the only Allah, the lovers of Rasulullah they have no limits. Because they are in line with the miracles of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, the problem that we run into is ego. You know, somebody did, you know, we hear or we read or we see someone doing this and, and, and just like when, shay when Shaitan was ordered to bow to Adam al Islam, what was his issue? He says, why him and not me? What was Quraysh's issue with Rasulullah Why you and not someone else? You know, so those who have this attitude that deny all the miracles of the only Allah, the basis of it is why them and not me, which is the sunnah of shaitan. And yet we are commanded to follow the sunnah of Rasulullah <laughs> But if you look at most people today, we, they, you know, most, pe most of us unfortunately choose to follow the sunnah of shaitan, you know, the ego. Uh, automatic denial. And I see, you know, even in the world, worldly sense, you know, you see many things where, okay, if I don't understand it, then I deny it automatically. Because I'm so great, I should understand everything. I mean, that's, that's the basis of this. That, you know, I'm so smart and great that everything is in my comprehension. If I can't understand it, then, it, then, then it's not real. Again, the ego, which is the sunnah of shaitan. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from this. You know, and may he fill our hearts with the love of his love and the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Uh, those who have not made sunnah, go and make sunnah, inshallah.